Welcome to season four of the Today is a Good Day podcast, a podcast to bring you a new point of support as you navigate your NICU journey. This season, you will hear even more personal stories from families who have been where you are today. Some of the stories you will hear will provide you with important advice from medical professionals like case managers and high-risk OBGYNs. You will also hear advice about opportunities you can take to focus on self-care and more. Please don't forget to subscribe to the Today is a Good Day podcast wherever you enjoy your podcast or share this episode with anyone who might find it helpful. Navigating your baby's health after discharge can be overwhelming. Our guest today will help us navigate the post-NICU experience with determining priorities and staying organized with post-NICU life. Dr. Kate Chappell is an associate professor with the University of South Carolina College of Nursing and is a pediatric nurse practitioner. She received her PhD in nursing from the University of South Carolina and has been a nurse for nearly 20 years. She worked in the pediatric intensive care setting and as a nurse practitioner in pediatric neurology and forensics and child abuse. She has been nursing faculty since 2007, teaching nurses and nurse practitioners. Her research and practice interests include family and healthcare provider vigilance for child abuse, creating equitable access to resources, integration of social determinants of health and nursing education, and resource support for children with specific healthcare needs. She serves as the advocacy and policy chair for the developmental, behavioral, and mental health special interest group in the National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners. She is also the co-program director alongside Dr. Victoria Davis for two South Carolina-based programs funded by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. One program called Child Care Ready for All focuses on providing health need, focused training and support for daycare and family care providers for children with a variety of health needs. The other program is Baby Coach, which focuses on providing nurse coaching support for families who have a baby leaving the NICU or special care nursery. Dr. Chapel is passionate about families feeling the emotional and material support they need to care for their child and feel secure in the care others are providing to help families grow and stay strong and support the best outcomes for their children. Dr. Chapel, grateful to have you here. I'm so glad our paths crossed a couple of months ago. Yes, absolutely. I was so glad that our project coordinator connected us. So talk to us about how you got into this line of work. You have so much experience. You're a part of so many programs. Tell us more about it. You know, I think that whenever you start working in one part of a helping profession, you just sort of continue to see the path and the needs. And working with different families, as I did initially as a nurse in pediatric intensive care, you know, we get a wide variety of children into that setting. And it could be car accidents. It could be an acute illness but also a lot of children who started off in the neonatal intensive care unit. And some of those families just kind of seeing where their their journey has taken them and what those ongoing challenges and victories were, it's just really um, gets you thinking about what we can do to help make that process smoother and better for families. That's wonderful. And, you know, we talk to so many different NICU families. And I'll tell you, even from our own personal experience, graduating from the NICU with our 23-weeker was really scary. We we joke about it often with the medical team that they had to basically kick us out of the NICU. But I think part of the fear of leaving is it's overwhelming to think about the cardiologist follow-up appointments, the neurologist follow-up, the early intervention. How do you manage all of this? So when you work with NICU families, it can be really overwhelming to follow, to manage those follow-up appointments How do you help them determine the priorities for care and scheduling all of those appointments? Yeah, so it is it is a challenge. And I think what we first have to consider is that the most basic needs are met. So if that baby has got cardiology appointments or neurology appointments, those are going to be really key um, to prioritize up front, Um, even ahead of sometimes something like a developmental pediatrics visit, because we need to get those basic systems um, in check, make sure everything's going well. If we're on medications related to cardiac, those types of things, we need to make sure those things are are taken care of. 
But one of the things that can really help with coordinating that is if you are able to be part of a healthcare system, that those specialists are all in the same healthcare system. That's not something that's happening. Um, it would be something that I would I would talk with my primary care provider or my neonatologist about how can I get these as coordinated as possible so that they can communicate about those appointments. Well, I think you just brought up a good point. I was just going to ask you that because families are overwhelmed with all the paperwork they're going through, discharge paperwork, scared to take their baby home. Maybe they just did an overnight in the hospital with their baby to to stay with them. Is the neonatologist the point person that they should ask saying, hey, I know I have to set up these appointments. Where do I even start? So I think it depends on the NICU team that you're working with. Um, if you have a case manager who's already getting very involved early while you're still in the NICU, certainly expressing that need to them. But I guess I would always say that if you're not feeling heard and whoever it is that you're not feeling heard from, whether it's the case manager, whether it's um, the neonatologist themselves, continue to speak up. And that's hard because, you know, we're all in that vulnerable. I'm, I'm a nurse and it's still hard when I get in a healthcare setting to continue to have to advocate for myself, because what would be lovely would be if people would recognize this person has these, these needs, or I don't know if they have these needs. Let me ask if they have these needs, but we know that doesn't always happen. So just staying persistent. And I know your organization does a lot to help provide that social support that can make that a little bit easier to do when it's like, no, no, we have the same struggle. Just keep asking. Mm -hmm. Bedside nurse um, is also a really good resource for if you feel like, man, I have asked for this help. I'm still feeling really confused, really concerned. Reaching out to that bedside nurse when you come to take care of and visit the baby can also be a good, good option. Does it also make sense for families if they didn't get to necessarily talk with the NICU team as in-depth as they want to connect with their pediatrician about some of these follow-up appointments and who might be, who their pediatrician might refer them to? Absolutely. I was going to recommend that, that if, because sometimes if we're in the NICU, you know, we're getting very involved in all of the neonatology pieces, but going ahead and being sure that if you had already identified a, a pediatrics office, loop them in, make them part of who you're involving in the care, make it clear you want the neonatology team to involve them in the care. And um, if you had not already identified a pediatrics office, because sometimes we land in the NICU before we'd had time to make all those plans, it's okay. Go ahead and, and you can do those reach outs, or you can, again, certainly seek those recommendations from the people already providing care for your baby um, so that you have that primary care grounded person on the outside who's not just thinking about the acute needs for the baby. Well, Dr. Chapel, funny that you should bring that up about pediatricians because we have an episode in the last season of the Today is a Good Day podcast talking about building a good relationship with your pediatrician and how to find one and interview them and talk with them. And we we talked about the importance of making sure you're comfortable with them because you think about the NICU team and how many conversations that you have with the NICU team, making a connection with them, that you want to have that same type of relationship with your pediatrician and trust what they're going to tell you on, on how to care for your child. Absolutely. And I will say that pediatric offices tend to, like, even if you just look at their websites, it can actually be very telling. What does their website look like? What is their focus? If you're wanting the warm and fuzzy, you're looking for one that took the time and effort to put the warm and fuzzy into their website. I've seen some really cute ones. If you're more into the straightforward, just tell me like it is and let's keep it moving, then probably the one that has everything decorated, you know, like a daycare room is maybe not going to be the best fit. Good point. Know? But also looking at most of them will have a provider tab that tells you more about the providers. And this is really common for pediatric offices on their website, that they tell you what their background is. Sometimes they'll even say, this particular provider is especially interested in this population of patients. And that can help you really target even your, your comfort level with who am I trying to have a visit with? Who am I going to interview? 
When families are getting ready to leave the NICU, and it's interesting, we we have another episode in this season of the podcast where we speak with a family who was in the NICU and PICU for 15 months, and she was talking with us about all of her follow-up appointments. I'd be interested to hear from you how you help families stay organized if they have multiple appointments that they have to go to post-NICU. Yeah, so... I am, and this is going to sound very old school, but I am a big fan of a paper calendar. Yeah. I have an extremely busy schedule. It all goes in a paper calendar. And, and that does not mean I'm not technologically savvy. It just means that the way my brain needs to see my schedule, I need to write it. I love it. So sometimes that can be a, a good strategy because that way you can easily see the holes and conflicts that are being created. If there are other children, for instance, who you're going to need to coordinate care for, you might even just automatically set up on your calendar. When I'm setting up the appointment, let me make an appointment next to it that's like, who's going to be the child care provider for the other child? Or what's going to happen with transportation? Whatever those boxes are that need to be checked in order for this to happen successfully for you, I would say to make it as a as separate to the side also piece. Mm-hmm. Um, The other thing is really, again, thinking through what can be coordinated. And I think sometimes we're hesitant to reach out to offices and say, so let's say that you had a Tuesday cardiology appointment and a Wednesday primary care appointment, and maybe those got made for you and you didn't get to choose. Not hesitating to actually call them and say, listen, same building or same health campus, you know, I've got appointments on two different days with the baby. Is there any way that we can bring those together? Um, That usually will work better on the front end. Like the sooner you're able to plan that, the better. But um, those kinds of things, not being afraid to ask, because what's the worst that they can tell you? Nope, we don't have any space. Or we'll call you if we get a space, if someone no-shows. Okay, perfect. You know, Um, I do think that really... We call it triaging, you know, in healthcare. So really making sure that you are triaging those visits. And again, that primary care can help can help you figure that out as to where do we truly need to go first and what can we delay a little bit um, while we get the other appointments sorted out. Really good point for you to bring up too, because I do think you get set up in these appointments and on your end you go, well, they fit me in, so I'm just going to take it. But it is important to say, and and especially also bringing NICU grads out. I mean, I know that it was a big process for us to take Claire out because we were so nervous about her becoming sick with her lungs, being a Mm 23-weeker, coming home from the NICU. She didn't go out for a really long time except for doctor's appointments. So proactively kind of reaching out to those doctor's offices to say, here's the situation. Can we figure out a way so that I only have to bring my child out once? That's that's Mm -hmm. a really good point. Now, I did want to talk to you a little bit because I know programs that you work with help families connect them with services, connect them with other programs that might be able to assist them. Can you talk to us about government and insurance funded programs that might be out there for families to look into? Looking at insurance uh, in particular, your best resource, because every company is a little bit different in what they provide is I would say to go to their website and to really look at what are the programs that they have for case management. Many, many insurance companies have a case manager and you know that case manager has a couple of goals. One of those goals is to help coordinate care for the families that are insured. The other goal is to streamline costs and services from the insurance company's perspective. But that goal can really help families too, right? Because we just heard the word streamline. <laughs> so that's that's always going to be better. Um, so if they have a case manager, I would, I would encourage reaching out to them and getting that help. And a lot of times insurance companies will identify kind of in a delayed fashion, they'll realize that this family could use this service. So being proactive on your end and just doing that reach out um, can often get some resources moving a little bit quicker than waiting for it to come up in someone's queue. The other thing with with government programs, so I was looking at kind of where your sponsoring partners are, where your target agencies are, and seeing that, for instance, in Pennsylvania, so if you look at pakeys.org, pakeys.org has um, good information on 
home visiting programs that can kind of help families manage the difficult decisions, the stress of a new baby. I think we don't ever want to forget that not only is there all the NICU things, things that we didn't plan for, things that are just, you know, more stressful than we ever imagined probably, but there's also this new baby who doesn't come with an instruction manual and every new baby is different. So even if you've had one before, this one could be saying, I'm going to give you a little bit of a different take on what feeding and sleeping looks like. They don't come with instruction manuals. Am I just learning this? No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) I think you knew that. (laughs) Yeah, we did. We learned quickly. (laughs) Yes. So, um, So home visiting programs in Pennsylvania, they have a robust program. And also when you look at resources and your health department. So that's kind of where a lot of this comes from, from a government level. Um, So looking at your Pennsylvania audience and then also um, looks like you have some Illinois audience. I was able to find um, just by putting in, you know, Google is Google is magic for those of us who didn't immediately grow up with Google. But if you're unsure how to find that, truly just putting in newborn home visiting in and put in your state and that government resource is going to come up for you. But it will be under the health department. So you could also just call your health department. Yes. Yeah, that's a yes. good that's a good point. I wouldn't have thought of necessarily looking that up for resources that are available, but depending what state you are in for our listeners listening in, definitely look that up to see what might be out there for you. Absolutely. And it some of it can vary by counties. Almost all of it is organized by counties, but some of it can actually vary depending on if a county is prioritizing. Um, certain groups of families. So it's a good idea to really reach out at that county level and make sure that you're using the resources available. Um, Particularly when we think about, so within home visiting programs, there are trained home visitors that are not necessarily a licensed healthcare professional, but they've had experience in a NICU setting, or maybe they just had experience with newborns. So that can be beneficial but also looking specifically for nurse home visiting programs, I think can be very helpful because those nurse home visiting programs are going to come alongside someone who has both the training and the ability to help pull together some resources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we talked a little bit about the government side, your insurance provider, looking at those resources that are out there. Talk to us about the role of nonprofit health and development organizations. What does that mean? And what programs might be available to support families through those types of organizations? So one of the really great nonprofit um, organizations that does have some reach um, in multiple states is called Help Me Grow. And Help Me Grow will um, actually work right with a family. And so our baby coach program is partnered directly with them for South Carolina families um, as one of our big resources. They will work directly with a family to work on that referral form to some state program that you're having a hard time filling the form out for because you're not a developmental pediatrician, (laughs) but you've been given this form to fill out that you feel like you need a degree. Sounds familiar. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So no worries. I've, I've got nurse colleagues who are like that form that I had to fill out for my child. I felt challenged and they've been nurses for 15 years. So it's, it's totally normal. I always tell people that if I were in this situation, I would be using these resources too. Um, so this is not about your ability, your capacity, any of those things. It's simply acknowledging, let me get to the experts because I, I need help. We all need help at different times with different things. So Help Me Grow is a great resource of kind of being right by the side and really helping to follow up with needs that may come up. Um, And beyond that, I think, again, talking to your pediatric provider, whether that be a pediatrician or a nurse practitioner, talking to that case manager, um, they're going to know about some of the local and state programs that are run by nonprofits that can really help families with not only those NICU specific things, but also I think about in South Carolina, we have another organization called Family Connections that is for families of children who may have a specific healthcare need. And so that may not be labeled 
as a NICU family need, but you may quickly find that those resources would be would be helpful to you. Well, and I, I, I heard you throw out case manager and we're talking about NICU nurse, post-NICU nursing support, lots of different language, visiting nurse programs. How do you help families understand what each of these roles provides, what their purpose is? Can you help us understand that a little bit more? Sure, absolutely. So, of course, when you're in a NICU or a special care setting, you've got that bedside nurse who typically is coming on 12-hour shifts, maybe eight-hour shifts, but mostly 12s. And you may hopefully be able to see that same nurse uh, on a repeat basis and have a little bit of a relationship with them and know that if you're making that middle of the night call because you just can't sleep and you want to know how how the baby's doing, that you're going to continue to hopefully get one of a couple, a few different voices. Um, So we do enjoy those relationships in pediatric intensive care kinds of situations that nurse is really focused on that acute care of your baby and making sure that the acute needs are being met and that we're doing the best we can to support growth and development at the same time to get you ready to discharge. Um, As you said, as you cling on to the the medical facility before you leave. And so- Only some of us, only some of us. Some were, (laughs) some say, I'm out of here, I'm going. I think Paul and I, it took a little while. We just, we said, no, no, you're for real. Where are we really going home today? (laughs) No, no, let's, let us stay. We'll stay just throughout the day. (laughs) Yeah. Maybe just another night. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So, um, one of the things that you should find that you're offered between the case manager in the NICU and the bedside nurses is rooming in opportunities so that you can have that time where you're sort of in a separate room with your baby and you're getting to be the first one to respond to the needs that are coming up. But you know you've got that backup that's you know right there in the next room. You just let them know that you need help. And they'll come in and they'll help, but they'll also teach you yes. to do. Such an important situation. night. Re- really important thing to do. So important. Um, I will say optimally, you would have more than one night. Um, <laughs> so Yes, that, you can. You, you, Yeah. So pushing for that, if you don't feel ready, you know, identifying what those concerns are and being specific can sometimes help that inpatient team really hear you about what it is that you're concerned about. Um, As a nurse, I think about before I go in and take care of any patient at any level of care, what's the most, what, what am I worried about? What's the most concerning thing that could happen? Because if I feel ready for that thing, all the other things will work out. So naming that for your healthcare team can also be really, really helpful because they may think they know what you're worried about, but you may have a different worry um, that they need to hear about so that they can really support you. So that would be that bedside nurse's role. And then, of course, the case manager that's there in the NICU. And that might be a social worker. It might be a social worker. It might be a nurse. It really depends Mm -hmm. on that on that um, particular unit setup. And then whenever we think about, so there could be a couple of different nurses you interact with um, after discharge. If your baby has um, durable medical equipment, so if they have needs uh, that could include, you know, a ventilator or um, a CPAP machine, those kinds of things, then you may have a home health nurse that's going to be coming um, sometimes periodically. Some situations we may have 24-hour care. But a lot of times it's going to be periodic and they're going to show up, you know, once a day and that may space out over time. That purpose is to both provide some of the care, but also to provide respite for the for the family to feel like you can actually go to the bathroom for two seconds and that somebody's here to watch and take care of your baby um, who knows what they're doing. (laughs) Right. Right. So that home health nurse is really only going to be part of the situation if there are kind of those significant healthcare needs that require equipment or that require a specific procedure. The other nurse that you may see is going to, again, be more with a home visiting program. A lot of those programs, when we think about our government-based programs, for instance, are fairly limited to a couple of visits. So what I would encourage you to do is to really maximize those visits, really write down your questions before. We always hear this advice, right? And really follows it very well. But when you're leading into that visit, 
thinking about what questions do I have so that I can make the most of the time that this program allots for those couple of visits that are going to happen. Um, nurse Family Partnership is a really great program that uh, works with families prenatally through um, the first two years of, of the baby's life. That program does kind of depend between your state and your county resources, but it is one that's worth looking into if you really feel like you're early in the process and you could use ongoing support. So let's say that you have a have a family who finds out during pregnancy that there are going to be some healthcare needs and we're going to, we're going to need NICU stay. That's, you know, a hard thing to hear when you're expecting a baby, but it also does give you the gift of planning. Mm -hmm. So you're able to sort of say, well, what resources can I get a hold of now? Um, nurse family partnership, other home visiting programs could be a longer term relationship. Just really depends on the programs available in your, in your area. So informative. Thank you. The, a lot of information for our listeners to hear. Really appreciate your feedback and your expertise in this area. Okay, my last question for you today. What is your biggest piece of advice you give to NICU families? I think from a nurse's perspective, the biggest piece of advice that I would give is to gather and grow your support system. It could be family members. Um, in my life, there are people who I have no blood relationship to who are absolutely my family that would be called in <laughs> immediately. Like, we're going to have to figure this out. And when we think about that support system, and that's going to include your healthcare team. And so as we discussed earlier, making sure you're comfortable with the people that are helping to provide that care. You don't want to feel like, oh gosh, every time I go to the pediatrics office, it's going to be a battle. I'm not going to feel good about what happens. That means you need to find somewhere else, okay? But when we think about gathering that support system, keeping in mind that there are many people who want to be helpful, they want to be supportive, but they may need some direction because a lot of times people come and they say, you know, I'd love to come help. And what they mean is they would love to just come and hold your baby. And frankly, you may not want them to hold your baby. So true. Very true. You may really want them to do the laundry, to do the dishes, to take the three-year-old out for a couple hours so that number one, one less thing that you're dealing with, but also so that that three-year-old can have some special and focused time that will really help them cope better with all of the change that's happening. So a lot of people need some specific tasks. So I would say gather that support system and also let them know what support you need because people try to help, they want to help, but you, you often need to let them know what that looks like. Great advice. Dr. Chapel. can't thank you enough for joining us on this episode of the Today is a Good Day podcast. Really appreciate your feedback. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you to our podcast sponsor, Life Celebration by Givnish. 